attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Headless torso, spared killers, and back to Jonestown. Plus this day in history with Mark David Chapman sentenced and our song of the day by Propagandi on your morning monarchy for August 24th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to wherever you are. Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. MediaMonarchy.com slash listen. Streaming live Monday through Friday, 9 to 5 Pacific time. News, music, views, and so much more brought to you by you. It is a Thursday morning and it's a couple seconds after 9 a.m., and we're coming to you, as always, from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in Peak, Portland, Oregon. Glad you're here. Appreciate you. Now, I just want to hit right out here at the top. We are still having a little bit of feed difficulties. And late last night, I had a session with one of my tech buddies, our buddy Mike in Philly. You can find him on the tweets at AfixJS. Although I don't think he's really using it much anymore. <laughs> we got into my code. And it seems like there's old remnants of things going back to, essentially... The pirate radio edition of Media Monarchy, back to the Blogspot era, back to the Bush administration era. We found old code remnants that's got Blogspot stuff in there. So we dug through a little bit last night, and of course when you're trying to fix things like code, it's not just change something and check and see if it works. You change something and go, okay, well let's give it six hours to work its way through the system and see if it'll work. So we worked on that a little bit late last night, and I'm still getting tweets this morning from people saying they're having difficulties reaching the site and getting the show. So I am working on it. Now, here's the other part to make sure. There are no shows to hear from August 2nd to August 13th. The last show we did before we took our vacation was August 1st. Then we were off entirely until Monday, August 14th. So don't look for any shows from the 2nd to the 13th. There will be no shows to find there. We've also been putting them up on YouTube to kind of get us through this problem. And again, hopefully it's going to work its all self out. And I think basically there's just some poison code that's just buried deep within my feed that now iTunes and Apple and Firefox and certain platforms are kind of hitting and going, oh, God, I don't know how to deal with that. Hey, these are the growing pains, I think. And I try and take it with, you know, not... I don't know if a grain of salt is exactly what I want to say. I'm trying not to freak out when my website isn't working well. I realize this is my job now. I quit my commercial radio job two summers ago to work for you. And it's not going to work very well if I can't get you said product. But I think these are good growing pains to have. I'd rather be going through these kind of difficulties now while we're building our own thing than feeling like I had all my stuff still sitting on some other platform and I didn't have control over it. So do not hesitate to reach out. James at MediaMonarchy.com. been trying to get in touch with everybody and look through their different certain ways they might have trouble. I see, and I can even see it in the chat. Our buddy, that gorilla, old code, one of the banes of their existence at the day job. We appreciate you so much listening to us at your day job. We know you might be sneaking in some earbuds so you can get a little independent, non-commercial alternative media when you're at your cube or whether you're in a garden or whether you're in a car commuting. We appreciate you being here. Now, here's the caveat. Media Monarchy is pretty much always for adults only, but on Thursdays it gets even darker, my friends. Each day of the week we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday's world news we call geopolitics. Tuesday's tech that we call cyberspace war. Wednesday, food world order. And then Friday we go over media memes that we call the entertainment industrial complex. I actually teased yesterday at the end of our daily DJ set at noon that we call pump up the volume. Big Morrissey news coming up tomorrow, gang. You're going to be excited. Just only sl slightly less excited than I am. Thursdays, however, it's the dark and disturbing. It is the underbelly of culture. Pop a culture, if you will. We call it holy hexes, and it is definitely not safe for work. And sometimes, even as our buddy James Corbett has joked, sometimes holy hexes is not safe for life. So you have been warned. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news before we dive into all our hashtag holy hexes news. Agitated Trump lashes out at McConnell, Ryan, Clapper, and the media. As WWF continues to roll on. Oh, I'm sorry, it's WWE. Rapidly strengthening Harvey forecast to slam East Texas as major hurricane and then stall out. So they are watching Hurricane Harvey. And bad news, you guys. Dad messaged me this morning. He did not win Powerball. Second largest jackpot in Powerball history as a winner. Apparently the winning ticket was sold yesterday in Massachusetts. And it's back to the Trump tweet memes. Trump retweets meme of himself eclipsing Obama in Twitter frenzy. It is hilarious. Essentially a listener, a user rather, a follower, 
replied back to one of the always popular Trump tweets. Now, again, that's some of the most popular real estate on the Internet. We've talked about this in the sad world of people who fight to be the first person to reply to Trump. That is highly valuable Internet real estate. Yeah, I was talking with Mike last night. Valerie Plame of Plamegate, CIA agent. She's running a GoFundMe to buy Twitter so that she can kick Donald Trump off of Twitter. Now, if that's not ridiculous enough in and of itself, and again, with GoFundMe, she gets all that money. You know, with Kickstarter and things, you have to reach your goal for you to get the money. But with GoFundMe, you don't have to reach a said goal. You're just trying to raise money. And usually people use GoFundMe, you know, for personal health issues and family emergencies. You know, important things like that. So there's no way, even if she ran a Kickstarter, an Indiegogo, and a GoFundMe, and a chip in, she ain't going to get the money to buy Twitter. However, she's going to get a crap ton of money that she gets to keep herself. It's like running your own personal fundraiser. So as if that's not ridiculous enough, as if she's going to be able to raise enough money to buy Twitter, or even become a, you know, a, a player at the board, the second largest stockholder, still doesn't make you the owner. Do you think for a second Twitter would want to get rid of its most popular user? Now, I know it's not popular in the terms of follows. That's for all the idiot pop stars, Katie and Justin and the like. He is must-see TV. Much the same reason he is now America's next top president is because corporate media can't get enough of him. He is boffo box office. He is must-see TV. That's why Twitter loves him. He's pretty much the lifeline keeping Twitter alive. Now, that's a bit of a sidebar, and I'm trying to do the lamestream news, and I'm just keeping you from the Fox News headline, Cheerleaders Forced to Do Painful Splits by High School Coach. And the mainstream corporate media wonders why it's not doing well. Let's look at the breaking fact checks, shall we? Because, again, as we continue to joke, you couldn't possibly rub two brain cells together and use your own critical thinking skills. Two-thirds of those on Medicaid are children, seniors are disabled. That's from PolitiFact. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said that Trump could be the greatest president in history. That's from Snopes. Angelina Jolie acted like a big kid in Toy Store, made up by Hollywood Life. That's from Gossip Cop. What you need to know about former Arizona Sheriff Joe Arpaio's record on illegal immigration. That's from the Bilderberger Amazon Washington Compost. And... The ever-popular was Driver Acting in Self-Defense from FactCheck.org. I believe that's the third time we've read that one this week, so it doesn't look like the Fact Check is doing real great. Or there's not as many nails as you guys act like when you're running around with a hammer. You're listening to The Morning Monarch, and we are just getting rolling, my friends, and we are brought to you by you. Huge thanks to all our supporters, patrons, donors, and otherwise at MediaMonarchy.com slash support. All right. Brace yourself. Let's get into the Holy Hex's headlines. And again, everything we go over on these shows, no matter what day of the week it is, we have tweeted out the stories an hour ahead of showtime. So if you're listening live, you can follow along on the show notes. More people were shot in Chicago over the last weekend than any other this year, except for the 4th of July weekend that spanned four days. So, of course, four days means an extra day of murder. According to the Chicago Tribune and police data, a total of 63 people were shot, eight killed as violence erupted all over the city. The level of violence exceeded the 52 shot on the three-day Memorial Day, but ooh, fell short of the 102 hit by gunfire over the long 4th of July weekend. This according to Chicago Tribune data. Still, fewer people have been shot in Chicago this year than at this time last year. It's only 2,435 shot compared to the 2,710 this time last year in Chicago. The violence in Chicago continues despite... The Trump administration sending in dozens of ATF agents to work with the Chicago Police Department back in June. Per U.S. News & World Report, ATF agents were sent in to assist with ballistics information intended to help cops track down suspects quicker while identifying repeat offenders. Which, again, when you point at someone, you should probably check out the three, four fingers pointing back at themselves. They will join some 35 to 40 ATF agents already assigned to Chicago. The goal is to prosecute as many of these guys as possible federally, where they will serve long prison terms in the nice prison industrial complex. That's a money-making operation. So that's from Zero Hedge. 63 shot, 8 dead in Chicago's second most violent weekend of 2017. But let's look at those numbers in a slightly different way, shall we? So we hop over to the aforementioned Chicago Tribune. 
33 people wounded. Seven fatally within 13 hours from Saturday to Sunday across the city in separate shootings, which includes an attack in the West Pullman neighborhood that left one man dead and wounded six others. In the West Pullman neighborhood on the city's far south side. You thought the south side was rough. Now it's the far south side. I don't know if Gary Larson has anything to do with that, but the man was killed. Six other people were wounded in a single attack about 2.30 a.m. in the parking lot of a banquet hall used as a nightclub. So there's the 33 sinks for you. 33 people shot, seven fatally in 13 hours. Um, for and d- that's that how the... That's how the dailies run it. That's how that action works. Noted in the chat, the dead have more rights in Chicago than felons. The dead vote for the daily machine all the time. And again, we don't believe in the phony political left-right game. However, when you look at cities that are run by fake Republicans versus cities that are run by fake Democrats, fake Democrat cities sure seem to be filled with crime. So let's go from 33 to 33 as a packed-out carriage traveling at high speed crashed into the back of an unoccupied park train in Philly yesterday. No, it's uh, two days ago, I should say. Two days ago in Philly, 33 injured. So you're looking for uh, an inbound Norristown train. We've identified 33 patients that were on that train. That train came into the station and struck another train car or trolley car, depending on um, SEPTA's definition, that was stopped and unoccupied. Um, And as the mayor indicated, all the resources of Upper Darby Township uh, came together um, when the mass casualty response was announced. Police units, fire department units, paramedics from the local hospitals, the local ambulance corps, emergency management, um, all across the spectrum. This is not an unusual location for us to conduct emergency operations. Uh, We've been through the uh, mass casualty incident uh, response scenario here on prior occasions. This one went just like we would have expected with the plans that we put in place and the scenarios that we practice. Um, the fire department and the EMS, to be quite honest with you, were the lead agency uh, on this response. The police department just provided the support that was necessary with traffic and crowd control and helping uh, achieve the goals of a mass casualty incident. So- All 33 people aboard the SEPTA train were injured after the collision around 12.15. This is actually two days ago in Philly. Two trains collided at high speed at the 69th Street Terminal in Philadelphia. As we look at the murder and mayhem and chaos going on around the world, that's what we do on Thursdays. So watch out. Now there's a story I'm still sort of working on and trying to figure out. And even the story I had bookmarked to talk about today, of course, has been updated when I was doing the last little bit of show prep late last night. Now, like some websites do, some news sites, and actually I generally find this annoying, I want the original story to stay the original story. When you update it, I wish they would make a new post. Now, big places like the Washington Post and others, when they get a big story update, they go back and update the original thing. So even though my tweet may say, early part of story, even if you still click that later and goes to the story, they've updated it. So I had the original story where there were still more questions, I suppose, from the Washington Post. But now they have actually updated that, even though now there are still a lot more questions than answers. Danish police said Wednesday that a headless torso found in waters off Copenhagen is that of missing Swedish journalist Kim Wall, the Associated Press reported. The torso was attached to a piece of metal, the police said, likely with the purpose to make it sink. The identification of Wall's remains marked a major turning point in a case that has gripped Denmark and journalists around the world since Kim Wall vanished Thursday, August 10th while reporting aboard the submarine of inventor Peter Madsen. Madsen, who was charged in connection with Wall's death, has admitted she died on board the vessel, quote, and that he consequently buried her at sea, end quote, off the coast of Copenhagen, police announced Monday. A passing passing cyclist found the headless torso on shore Monday, nearly two weeks after reporter Wall disappeared, and Madsen escaped from the sinking submarine. Madsen at first claimed Wall left the UC3 Nautilus alive before it sank, but now admits she died in an accident and he threw her body into the water. The body washed ashore after having been at sea for a while, Copenhagen police investigator Jens Mueller Jensen told reporters. Police were able to match DNA from the torso to Wall's toothbrush and hairbrush, along with blood found in the submarine. The cause of the journalist's death is not yet known. It is with boundless sorrow and dismay that we receive the news that the remains of our daughter and sister Kim have been found, Wall's mother Ingrid Wall wrote in a Facebook post yesterday. 
adding that the full extent of the disaster is not yet clear and there are still a number of questions to be answered. The mother described her daughter as a widely respected journalist who gave voice to the weak, vulnerable, and marginalized people. The freelance journalist was last seen on the evening of August 10th, leaving the Copenhagen Harbin with Harbor with Madsen in the Nautilus, which is described on its website as one of the world's largest home-built submarines. Madsen, 46, built the Nautilus nearly a decade ago. He has since launched plans to build a crowdfunded space laboratory, according to the BBC. Wall, originally from Sweden, was working on a story about the engineer, according to her family. After reporting from the heart of post-war Sri Lanka and the capital of North Korea, taking a submarine trip with a passionate inventor seemed typical for the 30-year-old freelancer, as her friends told it. That's what she did. She just wandered places, said Christopher Harris, a reporter for AL.com who met Wall when they both studied at Columbia University. She trusted somebody. And then this is what happened, Harris told the Washington Post, which is, again, where we're grabbing this story from. Exactly what happened on the Nautilus almost two weeks ago remains a mystery. Before his story changed, Matson told the police that he dropped Wall off from the ship on late August 10th and later barely made it after the ballast tank malfunctioned and the Nautilus sank in less than a minute. I couldn't close hatches or anything, Matson told a Danish television station. But a witness contradicted this. He told reporters that he saw Matson emerge from the belly of the vessel and stay in the submarine's tower until water began pouring into it. Only then did Matson swim to a nearby boat. There was no panic at all. The man was absolutely calm. Copenhagen police arrested Madsen on a charge of involuntary manslaughter after the sinking, according to a police news release, and accused him of deliberately wrecking the submarine, which was later lifted from the bottom of the bay. There's nobody on board, neither dead or alive, Copenhagen's homicide police chief told reporters at the time. Madsen denied the manslaughter charge. But a judge ordered that he be held for 24 days while police continue investigating. On Monday, police said Madsen recounted that she died on board. Court proceedings have been closed to the public. In the absence of information, the case has taken on the air of the Scandinavian crime thrillers for which the region is known, so said the New York Times. A tattered life jacket found floating in the water seemed like a clue last week, the Associated Press reported, but it turned out to be unrelated. And Wall's family, who initially told the Amazon Post they hoped she'd come back safely, have since, of course, abandoned that hope. It seems the worst has happened, her parents and brother said in a statement last week. Without explaining what accident Madsen blamed for Wall's death, Copenhagen police said Monday that they expected to find her body in the water off the coast eventually. Investigators mapped the submarine's route, and divers searched along it Friday with helicopters joining in over the weekend. On Monday, according to CNN, a cyclist found a female's body, armless, legless, and headless, on the shore on the other side of an island where the submarine set off it had been sent for DNA testing. It is clear that the police, like the media and everybody else, is speculating whether this female body is Kim Wall, but it was way too soon to tell police spokesman said at a news conference. Danish police on Wednesday confirmed a headless torso that washed up on a Copenhagen beach are the remains of a missing woman. Swedish journalist Kim Wall was last seen alive on August 10th. She boarded a submarine with its owner-operator Peter Madsen, reportedly with the intention of interviewing him. The submarine was sighted several hours later from a merchant ship and was seen again the next day from a lighthouse. 30 minutes after that sighting, the submarine sank and Madsen escaped from the vessel. On August 21st, a headless torso washed up on a Copenhagen beach. Two days later, police confirmed it was the remains of Kim Wall. Peter Madsen originally told police he dropped Wall off in Copenhagen. He then changed his story, saying Wall died on board the submarine and he buried her at sea. Police say the journalist's headless and limbless body was deliberately mutilated. Madsen denies a charge of manslaughter and a court case is continuing. Kim Wall was 30 years old. She worked as a freelance reporter for the New York Times, The Guardian and Vice, among many other publications. Here's how we first covered the Kim Wall story and some more maritime mysteries. Mystery surrounds the suspected death of a journalist in a sunken submarine. A Danish amateur submarine and rocket builder known as Rocket Madsen has been arrested over the disappearance of a Swedish journalist who was reportedly on his submarine before it sank. Freelance journalist Kim Wall was last seen on board the UC3 Nautilus submarine with owner Peter Madsen. The submarine left the port of Copenhagen last Thursday evening. Wall's boyfriend reported her missing early Friday morning when they didn't return, which prompted a search and rescue operation. 
Private motorboats later discovered the downed submarine near the Drogden Lighthouse in Kue Bay. Madsen reportedly jumped into the water and swam for safety as the submarine sank. After he was brought to shore, Madsen told police that the submarine sank due to problems with a ballast tank. He also claimed that Wall had been dropped off at the port of Copenhagen on Thursday night and hadn't been on board when the vessel sank. The crowdfunded UC3 Nautilus is reportedly the largest private-built submarine in the world. Contrary to Madsen's claim of a technical fault, Copenhagen police said the submarine was sunk deliberately, but no body was found inside. According to Wall's Twitter biography, she lived in New York and Beijing. Her work has appeared in various publications such as The Guardian, The New York Times, and Foreign Policy magazine. Kim Wall's family said the journalist was with Madsen to conduct an interview for a story. Madsen has been charged with involuntary manslaughter, but he has denied any wrongdoing. That from the always strange Tomo News, which creates these elaborate computer-generated scenarios. You can get that entire clip, of course, in the show notes. Everything we say and play always included in the show notes, so you can continue your research. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy. It's a Holy Hexes edition for Thursday, August 24th, 2017. I'm your host, Webmaster DJ, and so very much more. James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Let's continue to dive deep down into the muck as we do on Thursdays. A man who shot and wounded a judge outside a county courthouse before being gunned down by a probation officer was the father of a high school football player who was convicted of rape in 2013. You're sitting on a bench. You have to carry a gun because there's so many nutcases out there. We want retaliation, you know. An Ohio judge apparently ambushed outside the courthouse, shot several times, but able to return fire. Tonight, while investigators look to solve the mystery of what sparked that attack, a local attorney wonders what if, what if he had answered a call from that gunman. News 5 Frank Wiley spoke with that attorney and joins us now with more on what he had to say. Danita, the attorney, is questioning every conversation he had with Nathaniel Richmond. He never expected any. A family went from one tragic headline to the next. A rape conviction put his son, a Steubenville High School football player, in lockup. Four years later, crossfire outside Jefferson County's courthouse will put Nathaniel Richmond in his grave after he took aim at a judge. Our thoughts and prayers are with Judge Brzee's. He has served Jefferson County um, for decades, and right now our main priority is to make sure that he is safe. Witnesses watched. Some saw Judge Brzee's fire back. Others saw a probation officer return fire. Attorney Walter Madison heard what happened and wondered, what if he had picked up? I don't know what his phone calls meant that I missed yesterday. I, I, I don't know. Madison represented Richmond's son, Malik Richmond. He served about 10 months for his juvenile conviction. Back then, it was another judge who sentenced him. Over the years, uh, Nathaniel has been a person that sought my counsel on a number of things, um, from uh, being a, a parent to uh, just dealing with the things that we must deal with in life every day. I can't help but wonder if I would have been in some position to help counsel against this. Judge Brzee's was flown to a Pittsburgh area hospital. Judge Brzee's underwent emergency surgery and is expected to survive. While authorities have not commented on a motive, Nathaniel Richmond was a plaintiff along with several others in a wrongful death case overseen by Brzee's. Jefferson County Judge Joseph Brzee's Jr. was shot Monday morning near the courthouse in Steubenville across the Ohio River from West Virginia's northern panhandle and just west of Pittsburgh. Authorities identified the gunman as Nathaniel Nate Richmond, the father of Malik Richmond. Malik, then 17, served about 10 months in a juvenile lockup after being convicted with another Steubenville High School football player of raping a 16-year-old girl during an alcohol-fueled party in 2012. The case brought international attention to this eastern Ohio city of 18,000 residents and led to allegations of a cover-up to protect the football team. Investigators are looking for a motive in the shooting and haven't found a connection to the rape case. Prosecutor Jane Hanlon said a visiting judge from Hamilton County, where Cincinnati is located, handled the majority of the rape case. Records show Brzee's was overseeing a wrongful death lawsuit that Nate Richmond filed in April against the Jefferson County Metropolitan Housing Authority. So this sounds like basically classic small town good old boy shoot 'em ups that unfortunately connects to a larger scene of murder and mayhem and rape and destruction. Which again is in a lot of ways what America is. We are a giant haunted house where we built all our prisons and military bases on top of Native American burial grounds. 
So continuing that theme, a California man convicted of the worst mass killing in Orange County history. We now file this hashtag behind the orange curtain as several of our listeners live in Orange County in California. California man convicted of the worst mass killing in Orange County history was spared the death penalty on Friday after a judge found that serious misconduct by prosecutors had violated his rights to a fair trial. On Friday, Reuters reported that a California man convicted of the worst mass killing in Orange County history has been spared the death penalty over prosecutor misconduct. Scott Deckry will be sentenced to life in prison for killing eight people in a 2011 shooting at a Seal Beach hair salon. Derek Kai was facing the death penalty after pleading guilty in 2014, but the judge took the case away over accusations that a jailhouse informant was improperly used into getting a confession from him. The ruling means that, barring a successful appeal, former tugboat worker Scott DeCry, D-E-K-R-A-A-I, 47, will be sentenced to life in prison for killing eight people in a 2011 shooting rampage at a Seal Beach hair salon. If this case had been prosecuted from the outset by the Orange County District Attorney within the most fundamental parameters of prosecutorial propriety, this defendant would likely be living alongside the other convicted killers on death row. DeCry pleaded guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder in May 2014, making him eligible for the death penalty. But the judge took the case away from Orange County prosecutors the following year over accusations that a jailhouse informant was improperly used to wring a confession from him. California Attorney General's office has handled the prosecution since then, but the case stalled over litigation due to a widening scandal regarding the use of informants in the Orange County jail. This is just one county, one area, one case where the use of informants, of course, pretty much sullies the whole operation. In a situation where a crazed, murderous madman gets out early. No, I know, he's not getting out early, but he's sort of not receiving his just desserts, if you will. Let's continue down the hole, down into the muck, down to the underbelly. Hashtag Holy Hexes. Self-described mountain man Don Nichols was released on parole Wednesday after serving 32 years for kidnapping a world-class athlete out on a training run in 84 and killing her would-be rescuer, an attack that drew widespread media coverage and even became the subject of a made-for-TV movie. Nichols. N-I-C-H-O-L-S must report to a parole officer in Great Falls, was granted parole in April, the Missoulian reported. Nichols, 86, was sentenced to 85 years in prison for kidnapping biathlete Carrie Swenson in the mountains near Big Sky and killing Alan Goldstein, a friend helping to search for Swenson when she failed to return home from her run. Swenson, who was 22, said she was chained up during her ordeal and spotted her would-be rescuers before her abductors did. She yelled at them to leave because Nichols had threatened to shoot anyone who tried to help her. Nichols shot Goldstein, and Nichols' son Dan apparently shot Swenson. She said she was left for dead with a, quote, sucking chest wound, end quote, for hours as Goldstein's body laid nearby. Don and Dan Nichols fled and were arrested five months later after a manhunt in the mountains of southwestern Montana. During the parole hearing in April, board members noted Nichols' clean record in his more than 30 years in prison and his completion of educational programs including anger management and life skills. Don Nichols, who kidnapped Swenson to be a bride for his then 19-year-old son, so, you know, completely reasonable, normal thing, told the board members they would not regret their decision and he felt bad about his crimes. Before Don Nichols' 2012 parole hearing, Carrie Swenson wrote a letter to the Bozeman Daily Chronicle calling the father and son crazy misfits who chose to live apart from society and defy its laws. I endured being grabbed by both wrists, hit in the face, thrown to the ground, chained to Dan, threatened with knives and guns, marched through the woods, secured like an animal to trees, and spent a terrifying night chained next to Dan. She said she spent years in counseling and still has shrapnel in her chest that hurts her and brings back haunting memories of the ordeal that ended her athletic career. Dan Nichols was convicted of kidnapping and assault and released from prison way back in 1991. Four years after the case was the subject of a 1987 made-for-TV movie, The Abduction of Carrie Swenson, starring Michael J. Fox's wife Tracy Pollan. It was also featured in an episode of Investigation Discovery's TV show Your Worst Nightmare. Self-described mountain man in 1984 killing is released. 
Now, much like we're going to hear at the end of this episode when we dive into this day in history as it relates to Mark David Chapman, much like in that case, it seems like in this case, you're going to have maybe a lot of people that would say, maybe it would actually be safer for you to stay in prison. Because I can't imagine ever getting over anything like that if that ever happened to anyone in my family. I would kind of imagine I'd be counting down the days till your ass got out of prison. It's pretty dark here on your morning monarchy. Let's do a quick obituary. UFO author William Tompkins, 94, passed away on Monday at about a 2 p.m. Pacific time in San Diego, the day of the American solar eclipse experience. Tompkins, author of Selected by Extraterrestrials, My Life in the Top Secret World of UFOs, Think Tanks, and Nordic Secretaries, passed after only two years of stepping forward to share his ufological insights. From an early age, he felt he was chosen to have and be given special insights. When he was 17 years old, Bill Tompkins pointed out detail in his models to U.S. Navy Captain H.C. Gearing, and he basically would go on to work in the Navy for a long time. So that's our buddy Lauren Coleman, watching all things strange, all things Twilight language, UFO disclosure author William Tompkins dies. Now, actually, we'll cl include in the show notes, but I won't play it. There's a long compilation of William Tompkins going over U.S. military Navy operations and truth cover-ups. Speaking of cover-ups, let's continue down the muck on our hashtag Holy Hexes edition of Your Morning Monarchy. <laughs> and, of course, a lot of times as I try and find clips for these things, Sometimes you don't want to put the words into the search engine to get the results. It's always nice to use YouTube and things when you're signed out. <laughs> so, you're, so your signed out profile looks like a crazy person. Then when you're signed in, it's like, okay, okay. You, you, you just like regular crazy people stuff. I don't have any clips for this story. I did try, though. Former teacher at a private Christian school in Alabama accused of having sex with two underage male students, including once at a cemetery was sentenced to three years in prison Monday after pleading guilty to one charge. Under the agreement, Charlie Jones Parker, you know, Charlie spelled without the E on the end, like Charlie XCX. Charlie Jones Parker, 31, was sentenced to 12 years in prison, though of course she'll only have to serve three, followed by five years of probation. Parker must also follow the state's sex offender law and cannot have contact with the victim. She was arrested in March and indicted on 13 counts, of a school employee having sex with a student under the age of 19. The constitutionality of the state's teacher-student sex law is currently under appeal. Although the student's name was redacted from official documents, authorities previously said her victim was male. There needs to be a definitive line drawn in the sand that makes a statement to the public that this behavior will not be tolerated, Chief Assistant Pickens County District Attorney Andy Hamlin told WBRC. Charlie Jones Parker, who was the head coach for the girls' basketball team and, of course, taught physical education at Pickens Academy, had sex 11 times with one of the students between October 2014 and March 2016, including once at her home and once in a cemetery. Not long after Parker's arrest, her husband Jamie, who also taught at the school and was the boys' basketball coach, was charged with having sex with a female student. Well, at least, you know, they, they, they each understand their open relationship, predatory sexual relations. Nobody wants to have their, nobody wants to have to see their kid going through something like that. I've tried three or four of those cases in the last year, and it's hard on the kids and it's hard on the parents. Parker has been ordered to begin serving her sins on 9/11. Her husband's case, however, is set for trial on November 27th, which I believe is Black Friday. So that's pretty appropriate. I, I don't feel tardy. Let's continue to look at terrible things going down in our indoctrination camps known as schools. Of course, this took place just outside of the school, and we have been following the Slenderman case from its very beginning. Now, Slenderman, I first learned about back when I was the executive producer of Ground Zero with Clyde Lewis. It's a made-up internet meme, and like a lot of made-up internet memes, there's a lot of people out there who kind of think it's real. One defendant in the Slenderman stabbing case 
reaches a plea deal. One of the girls charged in the Slenderman stabbing case has taken a plea deal. Anissa Wire pleaded guilty to second degree attempted homicide. Julia Fellow joins us live in Waukesha County with the latest. Julia, what can you tell us? Our today's TMJ4 crews that were inside this morning tell me that Anissa Wire pled guilty and also laid out exactly what happened the day of May 31st of 2014. Wire and Morgan Geyser are accused of luring their classmate into the woods and stabbing the victim nine times to please the fictional character Slenderman. They were all 12 years old at the time. They're now 15. Wire's lawyer tells me she pleaded guilty to second degree attempted homicide her client as party to a crime with a dangerous weapon to protect the victim in this case, her former classmate from having to testify in court. She answered many questions from the judge after she entered her guilty plea. You would have gone through with the offense, which in this case would have been the kill Peyton but for circumstances that simply intervene. Yes. And just because Anissa pled guilty just this morning doesn't mean that it's over. There's now going to be a second phase where a jury will decide whether she was guilty by mental disease or defect. And that may change the terms of her sentencing. Wire's alleged accomplice, Morgan Geyser, is going to be here for a status conference. We'll see what happens at 1.30 today. And we'll give you more updates this afternoon and on air at TMJ4.com. Reporting live outside the Waukesha County Courthouse, Julia Fellow, today's TMJ4. Wasn't my idea. I Morgan came to me one day telling me that we should prove that Slenderman existed, and I asked her how, and she said we had to kill somebody, and I said okay because I thought it was just a joke. Honestly, I didn't think it was actually going to happen, but it obviously did. Did you feel any compulsion to? go through with the plan. I didn't want to hurt Peyton. I wanted to prove that Slenderman existed, but I thought that there were other ways. Morgan told me that there were other ways of becoming a proxy and proving that Slenderman existed, but I asked her what those were and she said that she didn't want to talk about it because killing someone was the easiest way. Was there any concern on your part, I'm talking about you, if uh, what would happen if you didn't go through with the plan? I believed that if I didn't go through with the plan and I believed that if I didn't go through with it, Slenderman would come and attack and kill myself, my friends, and my family, those I cared about most. And I was afraid that if I did not go with Morgan and help her, that she would find a way to elude authorities or anyone else who was looking for her and come back and finish what she had started, I guess. Just kill me. Which is why I went with her. Where did you get this? The alternative media, Jerry. That's where you hear the truth. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. So many stories that don't seem to make any sense on their face. Last few stories here on the Holy Hexes edition of your Morning Monarchy seem simple enough. Don't touch museum artifacts beyond any roped off sections. Yet, a family thought it was best to ignore this well known museum rule and place their child inside an 800 year old coffin for a photograph, of course, damaging the coffin in the process. Officials at the Prittle Well Priory Museum in South End, England said that the coffin was knocked off its stand when the child was lifted over a museum barrier for the photo on August 4th, causing it to become cracked down the center with a chunk taken out of the front. And there are photos that you can see this. Staff heard a thump, and that was the first indication something had happened. Museum conservator Claire Reed told the Beeb it was one of those isolated, terrible incidents. It's a very important artifact and historically unique to us as we don't have much archaeology from the Priory. The family ran off without saying anything to the museum, but the incident was caught on CCTV. Reed said nothing like this has ever happened before and that the staff was shocked and upset at the incident. The coffin is believed to be the last of its kind, according to The Guardian, and was found in 1921 along with the skeleton of a monk. The Priory was founded in the 13th century. The damage is thankfully repairable. The museum is now working to fix the coffin and said it will have to keep the coffin enclosed in the future because of one set of idiots. Now, these are probably the same people who, of course, knock over ancient rocks in Utah parks. It's the idiot selfie generation. 
everything's fake, everything's TV, everything's not real, and that's essentially how they live their lives. Now, speaking of child abuse, <laughs> it's all a disgusting, rich tapestry, my friends. Liz McKean, former British investigative reporter who exposed Jimmy Savile and the culture of pedophile protection at the BBC, has allegedly died from a stroke. Good evening. Liz McKean was one of the most resourceful and determined journalists I ever met. As Newsnight's Northern Ireland correspondent, she was fearless in challenging the paramilitary hard men. The IRA may not have authorised his murder, and Robert's sisters acknowledged that, but the fact that its members could have carried it out, covered it up, and then ordered witnesses to stay silent demonstrates the hold the organisation has over its community. She made her name, though, with investigations. She picked difficult subjects and was always on the side of victims who had been ignored, disbelieved or worse. Basically, how are you at the moment and all how's right. everything going? Everything's going all right. Newsnight has obtained documents. In 2010, she shared the Daniel Pearl Award for investigative journalism for her reporting on the dumping of toxic waste off the coast of Africa. The flood of allegations about Jimmy Savile's behaviour. It was, though, for her investigations into child sex abuse with which Liz made the biggest impact. Together with producer Myrian Jones, she worked to expose the appalling crimes of Jimmy Savile. She believed the investigation was suppressed by the BBC and the resulting scandal made headlines all over the world. The decision not to run it was seriously flawed. Feeling let down and rather out in the cold, Liz left the corporation, but not journalism. Her investigations for Channel 4 went on to win more awards. She was named Journalist of the Decade by Stonewall. His accusers were ignored and then others were abused. Tonight, they will finally be heard. Action! She was, though, above all, a wonderfully fun woman, the perfect companion for a decompression drink once the day's filming was finished. Andy, film the feet. Occasionally, her humour found its way onto the screen. Here she is, puncturing the absurd conventions of television news. And what's this got to do with the wider debate about trust? I was asking that question to thin air. David's long gone. Liz also loved being outdoors, sailing and hiking. Her final tweet just a week before her death was a picture from the top of Snowdon. Now we're coming into the Newsnight studio. Here Liz took her journalism very seriously, but never now succumbed to that common ailment of the investigative journalist, the serious ego. Sorry, I forgot what I was... Sorry, everyone, I forgot what I was trying to say. Liz leaves behind her wife and their two children. Liz McKean was 52. She worked at the BBC until she decided to quit in 2013 after executives banned her groundbreaking and brave investigation into pedophile Jimmy Savile in order to protect him and other high-level pedophiles from exposure. Often dismissed by the establishment as mad and dangerous, Liz McKean was finally vindicated in 2012 when the truth about Jimmy Savile's pedophilia came out. Lo and behold... Almost a decade later, it comes out that the BBC harbored Jimmy Savile as a disgusting pedophile. Not only was Savile a pedophile, but the ring he was a part of was even deemed to be satanic by investigators, which we generally believe is a red herring. They'd like you to think, oh, it's all satanic. That's a sidebar for a different time of discussion. This information, of course, only came out after Savile's death. The sick entertainer with royal connections raped dozens of kids, including even a two-year-old boy, while working for the BBC. The BBC reported that Liz McKean died of, quote, complications from a stroke. Now, that clip actually comes from BBC Newsnight, where they pay tribute to their late colleague. They do outright mention Pedagate and Jimmy Savile. So at least I have to give them that. A former Boy Scout accused former priest Louis Briard of sexually abusing him around 1977 or 78 at Lonfit River, according to a lawsuit filed in the District Court of Guam. And we have been following the Guam cases for weeks now. The accuser, identified in court documents by only his initials VQ, filed a $10 million lawsuit last Friday against Briard, the Archdiocese of Agana, the Boy Scouts of America, and its Aloha Council. VQ, represented by attorney David J. Lujan, is the 98th person to file a childhood sexual abuse lawsuit on Guam involving the Catholic Church. As scouts, VQ and other boys were required to meet several times a week at the Nuestra Señora de la Aguas Catholic Church in Mong Mong. 
The lawsuit says Bruyard's sexually predatory practices included weekly outings in which he would take VQ and other scouts to the Lonfit River to compete for their swimming badges. Clergy sex abuse suit says former priest Bruyard swam naked and molested scouts. Now, a story we've been following even longer takes us back to Polanski. A Los Angeles judge last Friday denied the impassioned plea of Roman Polanski's victim to end a four-decade-old sexual lawsuit, sexual assault case, rather, against the fugitive director. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Scott Gordon ruled that Polanski must return to California if he expects to resolve charges of sexually abusing a teen. The Oscar winner fled the country on the eve of sentencing in 1978. Gordon's ruling follows a fervent request by Samantha Geimer to end a 40-year sentence she says was imposed on both perpetrator and victim. It was issued on Polanski's 84th birthday and blamed the director for the fact that the case was still alive. Her statement is dramatic evidence of the long-lasting and traumatic effect these crimes and defendants' refusal to obey court orders and appear for sentencing is having on her life. Harlan Braun, Polanski's attorney, said the ruling came after the judge asked for proposals on how to resolve the case. Braun's proposals included several that previously were rejected by the court. Polanski pleaded guilty to having unlawful sex with Samantha Geimer when she was 13. She has said she was drugged, raped, and sodomized. Now, of course, the Associated Press does not typically name victims of sex abuse, but Samantha Geimer went public years ago. And the strange part is, she brought the drugs to the hot tub. What a bizarre, bizarre story that continues to go on. And essentially, the judge says, you see, the fact that she's calling for the case to be thrown out shows how traumatized and damaged she is. What a strange, vicious circle. And we end this strange, vicious circle and help transition this Holy Hexes edition into your Friday media memes as we head on back to Jonestown. A miniseries about the Jim Jones cult titled Raven is in the works at HBO, and Breaking Bad creator Vince Gilligan is on board to write and produce. After working with Gilligan on Breaking Bad, director Michelle McLaren, who helmed some of the show's most acclaimed episodes, is reteaming with Gilligan to direct and produce for Raven. McLaren has also directed episodes of The Walking Dead and Game of Thrones. Raven will tell the story of Jim Jones and his group of followers, who he goaded into committing mass murder-suicide in 1978. Actress Octavia Spencer is also on board to co-produce with Riley Smith, after securing the rights to Tim Reiterman's non-fiction book, Raven, The Untold Story of Jim Jones. The book provides a journalistic look at the horrific events that transpired in Jonestown from the perspective of a survivor. Spencer has no plans to appear in the series in an acting role. So let's all not hold our breaths for any underbelly CIA connections, of course, to San Francisco and Harvey Milk and Jim Jones. That's the end of your Holy Hexes headlines, my friends. You can find those stories and many more checking out hashtag Holy Hexes. And it's the case, same for today, same as any day. We only handpick 10 or a dozen or so of the stories from the hashtag to go into greater detail here on the show. There are so many other stories. So many other stories. And again, this is all built by you. We're not only crowdfunded, but we're crowdsourced. And a huge thanks to all the people who share the stories. Like Clint Torres. Like Booze Leprechaun. Like Sean Cathcart. Like Ray Vahi. And you. Now we're going to go out with brand new music from Canadian political punk institution called Propagandi. More on them in just a few minutes, but of course, let's take a look now, my friends, at this day in history. August 24th, 1456, the printing of the Gutenberg Bible is completed. Now that is the first, I think, on this date, and Cassie and I were talking about this this morning. She's usually pretty much getting ready to head out the door as I'm sitting down doing birthdays in this day in history. So we'll kind of talk about those a little bit before she heads out for work each morning. Gutenberg Bible is the first of three things on this date that I find really interesting as it relates to the massive leaps forward in human communication. And they're first two just right out of the gate. On this day, 1456, the printing of the Gutenberg Bible is completed. On this day, August 24th, 1891, Thomas Edison patents the motion picture camera. Another giant leap forward in human communication. We'll get the other one in 95. See if you can guess what that one will be while we get there. August 24th, 1932, Amelia Earhart becomes the first woman to fly across the United States nonstop from Los Angeles to Newark, New Jersey. August 24th, 1933, the Crescent 
Limited Crescent Limited train derails in DC after the bridge it is crossing is washed out by the 1933 Chesapeake Potomac hurricane. August 24th, 1967. Led by Abby Hoffman, the Youth International Party, the Yippies, temporarily disrupt trading at the New York Stock Exchange by throwing dollar bills from the viewing gallery, causing trading to cease as brokers scramble to gather them. Now the flip side to this comes three years later, August 24th, 1970. Vietnam War protesters bomb Sterling Hall at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, leading to an international manhunt for the perpetrators. So let's look at monkey wrenching the new world order from just those two stories and again we talk about all this because they're playing out again right now 2017 style we see now the renaissance of the violent fake progressive left they are loving it we are right back in the era of weather underground and all those groups the strange thing about a lot of this is though it does throw it throws a lot of what we've talked about in the past and in the now nearly 12-year history of media monarchy. It throws a little bit of this out the window of the previous ways we've seen divide and conquer roll out. Generally speaking, as has been my experience and observation, when the fake Republicans are in, the enemy is always over there. We've got to go over there and get them so we don't have to fight them here. It's always big-time war operations, because generally speaking, the fake right is, of course, funded by military operations and oil and that kind of shit. Then, when the fake left is in, the fake Democrats come in, the enemy's here, it's under your bed, oh my god! Like the 90s, all the militias through the Clinton era. Then the second it turns over to George Bush, oh, wait, enemy's over there, with a catalyzing catastrophic event, as all presidents seem to have, and of course we are bracing ourselves for what the Trump 9-11 event may be. Now what am I basically saying here? It seems like a lot of that historical run has been thrown out the window, because now we do have a fake Republican in, and it doesn't seem like the enemy's over there just yet. They are dangling that carrot in the way, but they are definitely amping up homegrown terror. Which do you think monkey wrenches the New World Order and is an actual threat to the system? Blowing up universities? Acting violent? They know exactly how to deal with violence. Or are pranks and practical jokes and actually, like Jello Biafra called it, monkey wrenching the New World Order? Throwing dollar bills at New York Stock Exchange? That's the kind of stuff we need to see. Not people in black masks freaking out and punching each other. We need pranks. And of course, we basically need to step away from all of it. That's my sidebar. Let's continue to look at this day in history. August 24th, 1979. The Cars performed at New York Central Park for an audience of half a million people. That same day, Prince released, I want to be your lover. And on this day in history, August 24th, 1981. Mark David Chapman is sentenced to 20 years to life for the murder of John Lennon, founding member of the Beatles, one of the most successful bands in the history of popular music. Mark Chapman was convicted of second-degree murder and sentenced to 20 years to life. He since applied for parole five times, claiming to be over his delusions. So far, however, his appeals have been denied by the parole board, perhaps as much for his own protection as for that of the general public. I think for Mr. Chapman's own safety, it might be a good idea for him to stay, you know, in prison um, because there's a lot of uh, people who are more of Lennon fans than we are that could take that to extremes and he, his life could be in danger. I think that he really needs to actually stay in there. Let him suffer. Let him suffer the way and let him feel the hurt that everyone else felt when John Lennon was killed. Meanwhile, Yoko has remained true to the message of peace and love she and John epitomized with their bed-ins 40 years ago. Having forgiven Mark Chapman for murdering her soulmate, she recently reflected upon what John would have thought of the world today. Well, he would have been very upset that uh, it's suddenly a very violent world again. You know, he was a peacenik, you know. But I think that he would have been excited about the internet, website, all that. <laughs> And as fans gathered to mark the 25th anniversary of his death in New York, she was cheered by the obvious immortality of his widespread influence. Satisfied. 
I think the whole world, uh, not just the musicians, I was totally influenced by his thoughts, his music, and um, good, for, good for the world, actually. It's great. You know? On a personal level, however, there's no doubt that she still misses him terribly. We'd have been loving. <laughs> uh, it's just that, you know, when I hear Grold with me, that's the one that chokes me up because, well, you know, he, he was saying Grold with me to me and, well, now he's saying to everybody, I suppose, uh, to the world, so that's yep. good. Yep, Yoko Ono, the occultist who met Lennon at a process church art gallery and his killer, who, of course, would be connected to CIA outlets like World Vision and the Bush crime family. Mark David Chapman's sentence on this day. Continuing to look at this day in history, August 24th, 1983, Jerry Lewis's wife, Sean, was found dead at the couple's home in Mississippi. Autopsy revealed she died of a methadone overdose. August 24th, 1989, oh man, Cincinnati Reds manager Pete Rose banned from baseball for gambling. 1990, it is ruled by a judge in Reno, Nevada, that the band Judas Priest was not responsible for the suicides of two youths after they had listened to the band's music. That same day, Sinead O'Connor refused to perform if the United States anthem was played before her show at Garden State Arts Plaza in Homedale, New Jersey, as is custom. A patriotic uproar ensued, which led to several radio stations banning her music. August 24, 1991, Gorbachev resigns as the head of the Communist Party. 1992, Hurricane Andrew makes landfall in Homestead, Florida as a Cat 5 hurricane. August 24, 1994, Dave Aberziz quits Pearl Jam, gets replaced with Jack Irons. And the third huge leap forward in human communication on this day, August 24, 1995, Microsoft Windows 95 is released to the public in North America. In a way, this is sort of, and again, like Cass and I were talking about, this is like technology astrology in a way. August 24th, 98, first radio frequency identification, human implantation tested in the UK, RFID in the UK. And August 24th, 2016, a year ago today, an earthquake strikes central Italy with a magnitude of 6.2. Published to my own website a decade ago today, U.S. Friendly Fire kills three U.K. soldiers. And celebrating birthdays today, quite the list. August 24th, Howard Zinn, Yasser Arafat, Kenny R2-D2 Baker, Mason Williams, Max Cleland. You might remember him as the American captain and politician who resigned from the 9-11 Commission and called it a farce. Pop soul singer Jimmy Soul, born on this day. Quicksilver messenger service man John Cipollina. It's also Molly Duncan, saxophonist from Average White Band. And Vince McMahon, co-founder of WWE, born on this day. Scientologist Ann Archer, actress, born on this day. And also Jim Fox, he's from the James Gang. And Joe Manchin, he is the 34th governor of West Virginia. And my grandma never liked him because he changed his Italian name, or rather his family did, from Mancini to Manchin. It's also Jean-Michel Jarre's birthday, the late great Charles Rocket, Danny Joe Brown from Molly Hatchet, Mike Huckabee, Jerry Cooney, who you might remember as being a Simpsons guest star, and he's pretty much Glass Joe, the first guy you fight in Punch-Out. Jeffrey Daniel from Shalimar, Stephen Fry, Steve Gutenberg, Cal Ripken Jr., Jared Harris, Major Garrett, Reggie Miller, Nick Ditton, Andreas Kisser from Sepultura, Dave Chappelle, and Cocky King. All celebrating birthdays today. You gotta wanna tune in to our daily DJ set at noon, and I will wet your whistle for new music with brand new music from Canadian punk institution Propagandi. Their new record, Victory Lap, is hitting Epitaph on September 29th, and we will listen to a short rocker called Failed Imagineer from Propagandi. I think I've joked before that back at the college radio station days, they were one of the bands in the CDs that when you pulled it off of the vault, it said, You can only play tracks two, three, and five, because it was just filled with swears. Failed Imagineer from Propagandi wraps up your morning monarchy. The Holy Hexes edition for Thursday, August 24th, 2017. I am James Evan Pilato from MediaMonica.com. Thanking you so much for listening, my friends, and reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra says, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.